Happy Sabbath. Amen. We're going to start with the word of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the many blessings. Thank you because you have provided for us during this whole week. Thank you because you gave us, um, you kept us safe, Lord. Um, you gave us health and gave us work. And Lord, you provided for our homes. And Lord, thank you for your many mercies, Lord, that you have for us. And now, Lord, as we come, this morning, asking you for the presence of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that your angels abide with us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will, be, will open our hearts, Lord, and give us wisdom and understanding, Lord, that we will understand what we have studied, Lord, those great truths that you have left for us, for us to learn and to live it in our life. Thank you, Lord, for um, being with us, Lord. Be with those who couldn't make it, who are watching us over the internet, Lord. Be with those who are here, Lord. And Lord, bless them in their lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Okay. We are in lesson number 10. Lesson number 10. And, um, we are going to start lesson number 10 says that lessons from nature and from grass and from God's providence we've been studying nature amen and how it relate God and the, and in nature not God got nature no it's God and nature or the God of nature amen uh, I want to ask, what should be the first book that the children and youth should have for education? It says right here in Councils to Teachers, it should be the Bible, the first book. And then it says, the second book should be what? The book of nature. So we should give more importance to be out in nature. Amen? Amen. In fact, we have a message that uh, we shouldn't be living in these cities. Amen? Amen? And our message says that we should not be in these cities. We should flee what? To the country. Not to the mountains yet. <laughs> but to the country. Amen? And now I understand why is God calling us to the country because he wants us to be what? Surrounded by this book of nature. Amen? Amen. And this book of nature will inspire us to what? To be more thankful. How are we going to be so thankful when we're like full of cars and smoke and, you know, uh, sin and you see all those uh, big... Uh, you know, commercial things and, and, you know, on the streets and, you know, promoting sin, you know, and sometimes you're like, you come into church and your mind just goes off, you know, you, and, and the Sabbath, even on the Sabbath. So, should we be surrounded by this book, you know, the book of nature, you know? So, you know, God is calling us through His Word and His truth Every day he's telling us what the wish that the council's been since since the 1800s, you know, that we should move to the country and we so be surrendered by this, you know, the book of nature. So let us go into our our lesson today because, you know, uh, that's why there's so much athe atheists in the city. That's why it just hit me right now, you know. That's why there's so much unbelief in the city, you know? Oh, and, and if you bring the city to your home, too, there's so much unbelief in what? In your home, you know? Because you're not surrounded by this second book. 
First of all, if you don't study your Bible, which is the first book, right? And then the second book should be what? The book of nature, you know? So that's, if you don't really study the first book, you know, because we are surrounded by, by the city, you know, by, you know, the, the Bible says, you know, the, uh, the prayer of Jesus says, you know, I don't tell them to keep, uh, keep them from the world, you know. Uh, he, when Jesus was praying, he says, keep them from the world, you know, protect them, you know. And it's so much stuff that God could do that the stuff that we get surrounded by, then we, can be, we become unbelievers, you know. How, can, how come our young people are saying now, you know, or when I get to certain age, I'm not going to be a Venice anymore. You know, when I get to, you know, to be 18, I'm not even going to believe in God anymore. You know, what are we surrounding ourselves of, 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 you know? Uh, is our first book, the Bible, and the second book is nature, you know? And if we're in the city, should we look for more nature savages, more nature outings, you know? Because we need to be thankful for God, for what God has done for us. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 40, 26, let us go there. Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. It says, 40, 26, sorry. 40, 26. The Bible says, Lift up your eyes on high and behold who created these things and bring out their hosts by numbers and he called them all by name, by the greatness of his might, for what he is strong in power, and not one failure. You know, when, when you believe in God, the living God. You know, I was studying this morning. Uh, you know, there was uh, this question. Somebody has asked this question during the week. And uh, it was, what is the difference between, you know, this, the seal of God? You know, and they were like saying the seal of God is the Holy Spirit, you know. And, and, and you know, they were giving Bible. But then, and then I got to the 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 seal of the living God. It's the Sabbath, you know. And I was like, yeah, you know, there's two differences right there. The seal of the living God is the one that He put in the middle of the Ten Commandments to seal up the Ten Commandments to make it sure that He is the Creator and He is the living God. So we don't worship uh, somebody that is dead, you know, somebody that cannot move. But we believe in the living God. So that's why he sealed up those Ten Commandments with the Four Commandment, which is the Sabbath, because is the seal of that living God. Yes, brother. Uh, that's an excellent point. And just to piggyback on that, a lot of times people do say, when we talk about the seal, that we have God's seal of his law, uh, they say, well, well, the Holy Spirit is the seal. And, and that is true. We are, once you get uh, justified, you're, you, you, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise to allow you to give you power to keep the seven-day Sabbath. Amen. The, the, the Sabbath or the seal of his law, that's what sanctifies us. We know that in Ezekiel 20, 12 to uh, 12 and verse 20. So the seal Amen. is the Sabbath because we recognize that once a week we come and worship the true living God because he's the one that's given us power uh, through the, the, whole, the seal of the Holy Spirit to be able to recognize that he is our God. Amen. Amen. So let us move to the introduction. Uh, it says, the introduction says, there can be little doubt that we have not sufficiently accustomed ourselves to thinking of God's providence care for us in connection with his care for the great universe around us. God's care for, the uni for his universe out to convince us that he can and will care for us and his children. While the Bible should be the first place, 
I'm repeating the same quote. While the Bible should be the should hold the first place in education for the children and you, the book of nature, the nature is next in importance. Amen? Amen. So like we were we were saying, so who are we gonna study today? Is God we're gonna study nature and God's providence. Amen? Amen. And how God like it, was, it said right here, how God convinced us that he is the one that cares for us. Amen? Amen. We should be sufficiently accustomed ourselves to think that God's providential care for us is connection with his care and great universe or unt us. Amen? So he left this beautiful nature, this beautiful earth, right? So we could enjoy his nature. Amen. Uh, let us um, go to. Uh, uh, let us go to the first question. Amen. First question says, "How is God spoken of in contrast with the intimate idols of the hidden?" If somebody could look for Jeremiah, Jeremiah, 10, 10. Jeremiah ten ten. Amen. States. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. And his wrath, the earth, shall tremble. And the nation shall be, shall not be able to abide his indignation. Amen. So the Bible is telling us that God is what? He's the true God. The living God. Amen. So he, he reassures this. Not only... He not only is the true God, but he is the living God. Amen? All the other gods are what? No God at all. That's right. They're not God. They're just idols. Amen? No so the true God is the God of what? Heaven and earth. The one that made heaven and earth, the creator. Amen? The living God. That's why he gave the seal of his, the living God. Because he reassured that I'm the one that made what? This earth, amen, this creation. Let's keep on, uh, on going in that verse. And the everlasting king, amen. Who's our king? Christ, amen. It, it says, and his rod in the earth it tremble, and nations should not be able to abide in his indignation. Let us move on. Let us read. Uh, somebody could read note number, uh, the note on question number one, please. The term living attached to the second name implies that he is constantly engaged in maintaining the universe which he has created and that he is just as unceasingly ordering all the providences which attend our lives. Above the distractions of the earth, he sits enthroned all things are open to him, to his divine survey, and from his great and calm eternity, he orders that which his providence sees, ministry of healing uh, for 17. Amen. Um, Amen. Uh, just reading this reminds me of um, me and my husband. We were just talking while we were coming to church today, and just, just thinking about how chaotic things are in the world today and, and all the horrible things that people have to go through. And I was saying to my husband, um, can you imagine at this very moment, somebody somewhere around the world is experiencing something so tragic, maybe uh, it's just the devil, it's like Satan is so rampant in the, in the world today. Some little child is being abused, somebody's mm. being murdered, somebody's being raped, all these horrible things. And you can't, you, you, you can't help to think that um, in spite of all of what is going on, these horrific things, it's mingled with God's mercy still. And my husband was saying, can you imagine when, when God's mercy is withdrawn from this earth completely and Satan is in full control? 
and reading this here where it says the living God and he's, you know, he's, he's constantly engaged in maintaining the universe which he has created. When he withdraws from this earth, it's like Satan will be in total control. And it's like, do I really want to be alive <laughs> at that time? Or <laughs> should I do everything in my power by the power of the Holy Spirit to make my calling and election sure so that you know, the Lord can put me to sleep because I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know how far away we are from all of that. But right now, the things that you have to hear and you have to see and, and know that people are going through, it's so heartrending. It's like, I don't, I don't want to be here. You mm. know, so can you only imagine that he, all of this is happening with no mercy mingled in it? Do you really want to be a witness? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, just to piggyback yes, on my sister's comments, uh, when we, if we do, if we're blessed to be able to get to that point, we should recognize that that's at the end of the world in the plagues. And if uh, we are sealed with that other seal of protection, then, then we'll be fine. We just have to um, recognize if the Lord thinks that we, any of us are ready to go through that and have enough power to do that, then he'll give us the power to maintain. Mm. Yeah, but I, but I, I, I hear all of that and I know all of that. But I mean, we're gonna still have feelings, right? Oh. To see people, the things that are gonna be, Satan, Satan's gonna be wreaking havoc around us. It's like I don't know if I, it, yes, we may be sealed and you know we'll be all right. But the, I think we'll still have feelings for other people at that point. But mm. there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, Amen. Actually, is uh, that's why when you go through the plagues, when Sister White talks about the plagues, she talks about it's the time of Jacob's trouble because you will be going through a lot of different things. You'll have the mental anguish, you'll be distressed, and different things like that. But in all of that, there there will be that peace that He gives you to be able to maintain and sustain to go ahead and grow through that. Amen. 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 God will give us that talent, that gift, right? Which is called martyrs, <laughs> the martyrs gift, you know, that we will be able to, you know, to handle all this by the grace of God. And only those who God will not uh, have them to sleep, you know, will, will pass through that. There will be many that will sleep before that. Uh, let us move to question number two. What promise is given to them who seek for true wisdom in any department of life or knowledge? Uh, Proverbs 2, 1 to 5. Proverbs 2, 1 to 5. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so thou incline thy ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for high treasures, then shall thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. Amen. Amen. So, the question was, what promise is given to them that who seek? for true wisdom in any department of life or knowledge. The question is, saying, is asking us, how do we uh, acknowledge or how do we get knowledge? You know, how do we ask for knowledge you know, in this life? And the Bible is simple. It says, uh, it says seek, right? It says cry, you know? It says ask, you know? And one of the things is we do, sometimes we do ask, but we don't what? We don't seek. Knowledge is not going to come to you if you just, say, you just ask, but you don't seek for it, you know? So, you know, you could, all day you could just be praying. You could pray all day. You could pray all day, but at the end you're not going to, you know, you're not going to find knowledge because what? Knowledge comes through what? Through the reading of the word. Amen. And you have to seek. Seek for his mercy. 
Uh, we have a hand right here. You have a hand up here. Your wife. Your wife. Your wife. Oh, there's a brother and then your wife. Um, as you were speaking about wisdom and understanding, um, even as we uh, look um, a couple more verses right there in, in the book of Proverbs chapter 2, um, in verse 6 and 7, it also says, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He laid up sound wisdom for the righteous. He's a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Amen. Amen. Through his mouth, right? And where do we find those words of his mouth? In I the just world. wanted to uh, comment on when you were talking about seek. I think a lot of times what we, as Christians, we, we don't seek because we will find the information there and then we are held accountable for it and we do not want to do that. So we want, as, as times we, we, we do different things and we want the Lord to give us the wisdom at that particular moment as we are in that moment, but at the same time, we don't do our due diligence and go into our word, which is what he gives us, the breath of life, the, the bread of life to give us the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding. If we do the seeking, we will find it for sure. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Okay. It's, it's really uh, deep. Yes. Right. Uh, yes. Oh. Yeah, yes. The Bible is saying right here that we're going to find a number four. 2 4, Proverbs 2 4, it says that we will find the riches of his treasure, amen? Which is, uh, uh, of his, those hidden treasures, if we look, if we ask, amen? And if we seek. And then it, it says, and then we will understand his what? His fear of the Lord, amen? That's just so important to, to find the knowledge of God, amen? Through the Bible, through the, you ask, amen, and God gives you that knowledge, amen, and then you seek, and God will, you know, will, will, will make you see these, his treasures, and then he will make you understand his fear, amen, and then make you fear his, uh, make you understand his fear, and then you will find the knowledge of God, amen, for those who are asking those who are seeking will they will find those hidden treasures amen and then they will see and understand the fear of the lord and then they will find the knowledge of god amen let us move on uh can somebody uh, let us go to james 1 5 let us go to james 1 5 let us if anybody has it, please read it. James, James 1, 5, Amen. it states, uh, let's see, it states, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Amen. Amen. So, do you want me to read the note too, or are we going to comments? Yes, please. Comments? Okay, no. Yes. The note says, whatever line of investigation we pursue with the sincere purpose to arrive at the truth, we are brought in touch with the unseen, mighty intelligence that is working in and through all. And education's page four. Amen. Amen. So if, like we say it again, if for those who say, oh, how come I don't have wisdom, I don't have the knowledge of God, it says, if anyone lack those things, wisdom, let him ask, and he will give it liberally. Amen? Amen. To all men, it says. Let us move to question number three. What may we learn from the large, larger aspects of the universe? Let us go to Psalms 19. Let's go to Psalms 19. Psalms 19. 1 to 4. 1 to 4. Psalms 19, 1 to 4. Amen. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handy works. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. 
Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them had he set a tabernacle for the sun. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yeah, one and two, four. Amen. Yes. Okay. Let us read note number uh, and, and question number three. Upon all created things is seen the impress of the deity. Nature testify of God. The susceptible mind brought in contact with the miracle of the mi mystery of the universe cannot but recognize the working, the working of the infinite power, not by, his, by its own inherent energy does the earth produce its bounties, and year by year continue its motions around the sun, and unseen hand guides the planets in their circuit of the heaven. Amen. Amen. Who marvels at this? Our God is the one that cares for every living thing. Even for, he even cares for the planets. Amen. He keeps them in order every year. The whole, even the sun, you know. <clears throat> year by year, it continues, you know. And that's our God, the living God. Amen. Okay, let us move to question number four. I have a quick comment. Uh, yes. Yes. Quick comment. Um, a friend of mine, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday. He shared this video with me on how scientists thought that there were only like 10 things that you needed for life. Okay? And then it was discovered that, you know, that number went to 20 and then 30 and then 50 and so on and so forth. So they went and they looked at all the planets. And this kind of like, goes along with the lesson. Mm -hmm. And they said without the big gas giants of, of, of Jupiter and Saturn, the Earth would have been destroyed long ago. And you'll notice that as these planets are going in their orbit, like comets and all kind of things, it hits the big gassy planets. And the gravity of those big planets is what pulls in all that stuff that would have destroyed the Earth. And when they kept mm. that in mind, they saw that there were very, very few places where life could actually exist. I just thought that wow. was an interesting fact. Wow. Amen, brother. Amen, amen. <laughs> you could see right there um, that God's mercy, amen? amen? We are like the smallest planet, right? Out of all, and he's the one that cares about this planet where all his people are, Amen. Let us move to question number four. What may we learn from the smaller aspects of nature? Matthew 10. Let us go to Matthew 10, 29 and 30. Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a feathering, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Amen. Somebody has a comment on this? He even cares for what? For the smallest things. Amen? Amen. Oh, brother up here. Right here, brother Stanley. He even cares for the smallest things. Amen. He knows how many hairs. <laughs> he counts, you know. That's he so very us. interesting. And as we speaking about that, you know, he sees, you know, he knows every hair on our hairs. And, um, and then um, in the note, it has a, a even more, you know, when you think about the little things, the smallest things. In the note, it says the wonders of the microscope. The sciences of chemistry and physics have opened up some of the ways in which the cre creator managed the details of his universe. The scientific law of the conservation of energy tells us that all the various forms of energy are but the same at last. They are but 
variant manifestations of the very same power, maintaining an orderly array, a thousand million suns, and at the same time controlling without any mistakes the molecules, atoms, protons, electrons, of which our bodies and all the rest of the nature are composed. And so, you know, when you think about that, you have to think about um, the human body and just how f fearfully and wonderfully we are made. When you think about Amen. just all the different um, systems that the body is made up of and how they all function in harmony. Amen. Amen. Uh, let us move to question number. Oh, somebody has a. Yeah, my apologies. I don't mean to go off topic, but since Brother mentioned about the stars and whatnot, it might be irrelevant, but I mean, the planet Earth is the third planet from the sun, the three angels' message. If you count the opposite way, we're the seventh planet in. I don't know. Just wanted to mention. <laughs> What personal encouragement may we receive? Question number five. What personal encouragement will we receive from these facts? Matthew 6, 28 to 30. Matthew 6, 28 to 30. I'll read it. It says, Amen. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Amen. And this is, what, what personal encouragement may we receive from this fact? Somebody has a testimony? Somebody wants to say something about this? Well, I, I think that uh, when we talk about just to just piggyback on these texts, uh, it speaks to how, and we all kind of get into this, we, we like to focus in on things that hasn't even happened yet. Uh, so, you know, we might look down the line a week or two from now and focus in on that and get our emotions tied into that, you know, uh, the old saying is, you, you know, you don't want to you don't want to go borrow in trouble. Uh, so, th the Bible speaks of those things in terms of uh, in Proverbs twenty seven verse one talks about boast not on tomorrow, you know, and then Matthew six thirty four talks about it's going to have its own troubles. Tomorrow's it's going to have its own troubles. Don't worry about or focus in on what hasn't took place yet. He'll take care of that. You focus in on today. Have faith and be in harmony with him for that particular day and all those things to take care of yourself. Amen, amen. Um, so what God is saying, God is a God of order and a God of peace, amen? And he wants us not to stress out about these things, you know? Because sometimes, you know, um, we work too much, you know? And sometimes life, it's uh, so fast, you know? And no... So we could pursue something like, let's say, a home, you know. You work all your life trying to make that money for the home, and there comes an earthquake, you know, and destroys the, the, the house, you know, that you work all your life, and you were, like, overstressing for this stuff. When God is the one that says, what? I'm your provider. God is the one, you know. If you make God your provider, he will give you what you need. Amen. And, you know, we could see it time by time. And, you know, sometimes we don't have enough for the rent, you know, or to pay a bill. And God provides at that moment. We, I could see it, you know, that it's like where this money came from, you know. God is the one that takes care of you because you make the living God, you know, your provider. So he, that encourages that, you know. God could take care of us if we believe in him, you know. If we work according to his will, he will take care of us, you know. And why should we worry about our raiment and our clothes, you know, for tomorrow when he's the one that take care of us. 
Let us move on to question number six. How is God's care for his creatures expressed by the psalmist? Let us go to Psalms 145. Psalms 145. If you have it, please read it. 9, 15, and 16. 145. Psalms 145. 9, 15, and 16. Number 9. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all of his works. Whatever. 15. 15. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Sixteen. Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desires of every living thing. Amen. Aren't these great promises? Amen. Yes. You know, the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Amen. And he gives what? It says, he opened his hand and satisfied the desire of every living thing. He gives meat in due season. Amen? That's our God. So let us move to question number seven, which we're going to study the regenerative power of the gospel. Amen? Question number seven says, what promise was given to our first father? That God would implant and counter working power against the evil that is working in all the world. Genesis 3.15. I know we know this by memory, but let us read. Amen. Let us read it from the word. Genesis 3.15. If you have it, please read it. It says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Amen. You have a comment on that? Promise, the promise is that there would be enmity between the two. And that, you know, is, is essentially a blessing because we know as soon as um, Adam fell, you know, we're prone to do the wrong things. Mm -hmm. Whereas when Adam was created, he was prone to do the right thing. Amen. So God put that enmity. Just think about if that enmity wouldn't be there. And I'll, I'll also be, yes, read brother. the note as well. Yes, please. It says the sentence spoken in the hearing of our first parents was to them a promise. Before they heard of the thorn and the thistle of the toil and the sorrow that must be their portion or of the dust to which they must return, they listened to the words that could not fail of giving them hope. All that had been lost by yielding to Satan could be regained through Christ. Amen. Amen. That's the promise. Amen. Uh, anybody else? Let, me, uh, let, let us move to question number eight. What impressed language is used by Isaiah to describe the power of and wisdom of the Creator? Isaiah 40, 26. That's the one that we read uh, at the beginning, amen. Isaiah 40, 26. You know, it's, it's so important um, as we think about God um, is putting this enmity between um, the serpent and he says, um, uh, again, also, the gospel is the power of the gospel and when it is preached, that power of the gospel going throughout the earth is bruising the head of the serpent. And so every time a, a message is being given, even today as you're um, sharing in the Sabbath school lesson, uh, you know, everywhere, anytime that we are giving the gospel, well, that is bruising the head of the serpent. So praise the Lord for Amen. the gospel being preached. The good being news. Given through each and every one of us when we uh, share it with others also. Man, he has implanted that, right? Since the beginning. Okay, let us read Isaiah 40, 26. And the question was, what impressive language is used by Isaiah to describe the power and wisdom of the Creator? It says, lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who had created these things that bring it out their host by numbers? He called them by all by name and by greatness of his might. 
for that he is strong in power and not one fairly. What impressive language is used here? It's the strong power, amen? amen. And he knows us really, uh, he knows us really good. Uh, he, he behold everything, he says, in this world, amen? Right. Uh, and he calls us by name. He, call, he, knows, he knows who we are. Uh, let us go to question number nine. Mm -hmm. I have a quick yes, comment to brother. make, brother. Yes. You know, it's interesting when you, when you look at astronomy. Mm -hmm. They do not have a name for everything. Amen. So they'll put together a random, you know, they'll say CS653 or something like that to designate some galaxy because they ran out of names. Okay. But God calls all of those things Amen. by their proper names. Amen. If, Amen. Uh, yes, just sir. to piggyback on my brother's comment, if you if we talk about this and it, if you go to uh, Psalms 147 verse four, yeah, let us go. Uh, there. He's actually talking about counting the stars when he talks about that. Let's Psalms 147 verse four. Just to piggyback on the Isaiah 40:26, it says, "Yes, he telleth the numbers of the stars; he calleth them." all by their names. Uh, we don't have time to go to this next text, but it's Genesis 15, 5, what he, to what he told Abraham, if you can count the numbers of the stars. So like my brother just mentioned, he, he's, he's labeling all of these things. He's the one that it created it, and he has names for each and every one of them. Amen. Amen. Okay, let us move to question number nine. For more than the first 2,000 years of human history, men had no Bible, mm. no written word of God. What did the people of this time, of those times, have by which to learn the will of their creator? Romans 1.20. Let us go to Romans 1.20. Amen. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Amen? Amen. Let us go to Acts 14.17. If you have it, please read it. Acts 14 and 17. Acts verse chapter 17. 14, verse 17. Yes. It says, Nevertheless, he left, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Amen. Amen. So, how was the first 2,000 years of the human history? Men had no Bible, no written word. What did the people of those times have by which they learned the will of their creator? Let us read uh, the note. They had one book of nature. Amen. Second, they had providential details of God with themselves personal, personally. So that means God would talk to them what? They could hear the voice of God straight, you know. So, and it says, and which their companions and with their forefathers as given by tradition. And they had the direct voice of God speaking to their souls. Amen? Amen. It says, the whole natural world is designed to be an interpreter of those things of God, the most effective way to teach the hidden, the hidden, 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 who know not God, is through His works. In this way, for far more readily than by any other method, they can be made to realize the difference between their idols, the works of their own hands, and true God. 
the maker of heaven and earth. There is a simplicity and purity in, those le in this lesson, direct from nature that makes them of the highest value to others beside the hidden. Later, uh, the poet. The poet and the na naturalist have many things to say about nature, but it is the Christian who enjoys the beauty of earth with the highest appreciation because he recognizes his father's handiwork and perceives his love and flower and shrubs and trees. Amen? Who's the one that enjoys more? The Christians. Amen? The Christians. So the Christians are the ones who enjoy this beauty of the earth. Amen? How many have gone to this most beautiful part? I haven't gone so much to United States, but I have been to the West, you know, from San Diego to all the way to Washington. But once you go through Oregon, you start seeing this nature that you don't really see here, you know. Man, those beautiful mountains, they're like, the, uh, uh, I was reading um, Council San Teachers, and it says that, could God put, make them dark, the nature will be dark or brown, you know? He made it green, you know? When you get to, like, Oregon, you start seeing green. Yes. Waterfalls, yeah. rivers, you know, and these lakes full of water, you know? You start seeing, you start appreciating the second book, of, which is the book of nature, you know? Amen. And it's so beautiful, that it's like, that's, that's our God. He made that, you know. Right. He made it green. So it will be <laughs> what? Alive. So it could be alive, you know. Even cameras sometimes cannot make it that beautiful. Right. As you walk and like, you know, I have stopped. I stopped right there, but it, this is in California in the north. You stop in this, uh, in this view and then you see Mount Chasta, you know, For it's real. so beautiful. Yes. <laughs> you see that glacier, and, and then you just stop and you just magnify. It's like, God, you are so wonderful. You, you made this beautiful <laughs> nature for us to enjoy. It. You know, that, that's me. I, I enjoy nature. <laughs> Amen. So, <laughs> I Amen. mean, I love, <clears throat> just somebody has. I have, yeah, yes. I have a, um, um, actually, with this note, a statement with this note. That whole, the whole note, when it talks about the book of nature, and that um, takes my mind to atheists. How can you not believe in nature? So that's proof that there's a God, you know. So atheists, it's not an atheist because they don't believe in God. It's an atheist because they are atheists because they don't want to believe in God. Because there's proof all around them. And I know that they love nature. It's just that you don't want to give credit to something you don't see or someone you don't see. So this is the reason why we have atheists. It's not because there isn't a God. It's because they don't want to believe in God. Amen. It, you know, there, and, and it's actually true. There's many even people that do documentaries and study nature, you know. And they glorify, I mean, they worship nature instead of, Worshiping the God of nature, you know, it, 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 it's so sad. But, you know, it's like when I, when you really want to see the stars in the night, go to the desert or go camping, go camping in uh, Yosemite, you know, Sequoia or, or you know, Mammet Lakes. And you just like, you, you just look at the dark and it's not really dark. Right. When you, when there's no electricity, the moon is the, you know, our light, you know, and the stars. They, now you see a bunch of stars that you don't see this in the city, you know, as much as you see in the country. Yes, brother. Yeah, I just want to add on what you said. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the reason, you know, uh, Satan set up his kingdom to worship nature, pantheons or whatnot. And it's true to what the scripture is mentioning that man looks upon the outside. So our man is, is, is bedazzled by the beauty of nature mm -hmm. and Satan confuses uh, man's mind into worshiping nature. 
uh, when we should be looking at their creator. Um, uh, but interesting enough, as you mentioned nature, I've been watching a lot of nature shows lately, a lot of documentaries, because they have some really good ones out lately. And I learned some stuff about animals and nature I'd never known before. But it is incredible how there is like this balance between all these different animals for their survival, uh, between the, uh, 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 not just the animals, but also uh, the, the grass and the trees and the, I mean, just everything is just, is combined on, on, on such a, a complex multiple level that it's just so beautiful, you know what I mean? And so I've been really enjoying that lately and listening to you talk about the beauty of nature and it's evident, brother, that you love nature. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but it's, I, I've been learning something that's just incredible. I mean, I would love to share a, a message about something I learned, but I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll save it for now. But yeah, just some incredible things when you look at how uh, all these things in nature are lenient upon another uh, for their um, for their survival and how God put that together. Amen. You. Amen. You know, uh, let us move to question number ten, and we gonna end up with this question: What far-reaching principle was announced in Christ's words to Nicodemus? Let us go to John three. John 3, 3 to 7. Got it. If somebody has it, please read it. Got it right. John 3. Jesus three, answered and said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Thank you. <laughs> Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Amen. Amen. Hmm. Amen. Let us read the note. The note number 10 says, Christ taught, the, taught Nicodemus that God through the work of the Holy Spirit could transform and regenerate man so that he would be reborn, a new creature. This new life is the life of God pulsating in the channel of fully surrender and open to his life. One of the most important discoveries of modern times is that living things can come only from previously living things of the same kind. Amen. All life comes from the living God, the Creator. He, too, is the Regenerator, making us new creatures in Christ Jesus. I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. Amen. 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 It's really interesting, right? That's what we were being studying. The whole lesson that we've been studying is been studying about nature, right? And one of the proofs is that the the said so the new discovery says that uh, that the living things can come only by previously living things of the same kind. Amen. To, that's to prove that Nate, the yes, that the Creator, the Creator, is the one that made us. Amen. And now we didn't evolve, and no, no evolution thing, you know. But it was God that created us because we are His creatures. Uh, let us do question number eleven. Let me see to finish that. What further statement of this fact do we find in Paul's writing? 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Does God have a creator power? Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Okay. Amen. It says, Therefore, if any man can be 
If any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know, when you're, uh, I've I seen it, you know, when, you, when you're in sin, you don't appreciate all these things of what God has done. But when you, when you become a new creature, every little thing that God has done for us, you start appreciating, you know, of the most little things, you know, that God has created for us. Galatians 6.15, and then we finish with that verse. Galatians 6.15. Amen? Galatians 6.15. If you have it, please read it. Amen? 6.15. Yes. It says, For in Christ Jesus neither for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avail anything, nor circumcision, but a what? But a new creature. Amen? So, what avails with Christ? It's a new creature. Should we be a new creature in Christ? Amen? He, if he is able to create all this uh, creation, He's able to create a new heart in our life. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for, the, for your study, for the Word of God, for this beautiful study, Lord. Thank you because our eyes turn on you when we behold the beauty of your glory. The things that you have made for us. How you care for us. Us being so smaller compared to those big planets. But you have a purpose for those planets to be there. For sustaining us every day, Lord. The things that we, are, that we don't appreciate, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all your love and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, because you gave us life to come to church today on this Sabbath. And, Lord, help us that we will receive that blessing before this day ends. The blessing that you have prepared for us, Lord. Lord, create in us a new heart. Give us a new spirit. Lord, take this heart of rock and give us a heart of flesh. We ask you this, Lord, and the promises, reading upon the promises that you have left for us in this word. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.